fucking very nervous. And uh, give me a sec. Um, and uh, we voted her in. Uh, and so the process and procedure after that is to invite her out. She, um, as far as I'm aware, is, is going to give a testimony, unless you're feeling a little bit, a little bit too nervous, Sue. Are you okay with it? Super duper. So as Sue makes her, her way out, just want to say that she's been asking and asking and asking to be a member for a long, long time. And, uh, you know, I've been saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. Finally got around to it. So um, I'm, I'm grateful that she's been so patient with us. And uh, as she makes her way, she's going to give her story about how she has come to faith. Are you okay? No problem. Hang on a sec, so just watch it. Okay, good morning. If you can all hear me. Right, good. Um, when I did read to do this, for the safety of my city at home, I thought quite a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> it's not feeling such a good idea now. <laughs> um, but this morning I heard my WhatsApp ping. And normally I look at my WhatsApp messages later in the day, but I thought, no, I'll have a look at it. And it was Laurie's message of Bible quote, and it said, I, I can do this through the strength he gives me, or some words to that effect, and I've forgotten, but it, it, was, it was for me. It was the same words to me, and I thought, I can do this. I am nervous, but I can do it. Um, I was raised a Catholic, and... When I think back to it now, I was raised a fearful Catholic. I was frightened of God. He wasn't a loving, caring God. He was a frightening God. He'd punish me if I didn't do the things I should do. I was fearful of the nuns who terrified me uh, because I went to instruction and they just scared me to death. I was scared of going to confession because I get along penance. Um, so it all was very, very scary. And I don't remember the Bible much. I remember the catechism, and I remember learning things off by heart, but I don't remember much about the Bible. Neither do I remember much about Jesus, really. Jesus, in my head, was this little baby in a manger, and that's where he sort of kind of stopped. Um, and so I left the Catholic Church in my early 20s, and I went to a couple of other different churches, which I've taken part in. But I've never really found what I wanted. I would like to say that it all came to me in a flash, but it didn't. I plodded through my faith, like I plod through everything. Um, you know, I didn't get up one morning and think, this is it. It's, it's gradually grown on me. And about four years ago, I think now, Heather invited me to an evening service at DCC. And I thought, well, well, we'll go. Just said, well, we'll go. It's only an hour out of our life. We'll go. <laughs> and we came and we loved it. And we felt the love and the warmth when we came in here. It was brilliant. And Jeff had always followed me to church. I was a church goer. He was the one who said, if I said we're not going on Sunday morning, he'd say, oh, great. You know, we'll have a cup of coffee and a lion. Um, and when we got here, he said, this is where we need to be. This is a place. And that's how we both felt. This is a place we need to be. And if anyone had told me 10 years ago, say, you'll get through Jeff dying without A, wanting to have another drink, which is something, you know, has been a problem for me. And two, without your faith weakening, I just said, no, I have. I've done both of those things. It's actually made my faith get stronger, not weaker. And I'm really pleased with that. And I realized the other day, well, it's a very, very simple thing, but it showed me where I am in, in this walk to faith because I, as a young girl, I carried my rosary beads with me like a lucky charm. They were in my bag. If, if Jeff went away for the day, I'd give them to him to say, they'll keep you safe. You see, rosary beads. And I found them in a handbag the other day. And I thought, I don't need these. I've got Jesus, I don't need these rosary beads. And I put, I put them in a box. That's where they can stay. I'll keep them, obviously, because they're my mum's. But 
I just want to really say thank you for having me here. Thank you for the absolute love and support that you've all shown me. Because for me, you've all really made Jesus real. Thanks. That's a blessing, isn't it? That's the name. Yeah, that was a blessing. Yeah, you with me, yeah? Um, so, um, uh, a former Catholic, I'm a, I'm a former Catholic, so it may be we're off to uh, rename the church, the former Catholic church, Congregational Church of, of Duckingfield or something, I don't know, but I'm going to invite the deacons out, and as the deacons make their way, we're all going to pray for her, and if you'd stand with me so we can pray as well, and then we are going to give her the right hand of fellowship, and then she will also get via email our constitution and our church code of practice, which apparently we have to do. And, uh, but we just want to say thank you. Father, we do, as we pray right now for Sue, we say thank you for her, for the blessing that she is to us. We say thank you that she could find faith here, Lord. And we say thank you that you, the living God, have moved upon her life, Father. Lord, she's a blessing to us. <clears throat> we see you working in her. We appreciate the honesty of her faith and her faith journey, Lord. We say thank you again that she's decided to make this her home. And we say thank you that you have made your home in her heart. Lord, we give you praise and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. And the deacons now give the right hand of fellowship. And then that's it. Sue, you're in. You can't get out. There you go. Job's a good one. Give her a big hand. Okay, you can take your seats. Um, I, uh, I just want to say something before we pass back to Peter. Um, just something that's popped up on uh, social media. Uh, just bear with me a second. Just need my phone. Two secs. Right, anyhow, I don't know whether you're aware. You might be, you might not be, but there is... Here we go. Just when you want your phone to work. It, oh, come on. That's the one. There has been a what some people are calling a revival taking place in America. Anyone heard of it? No, one person, John. Okay, so this is the start of what they're now calling possibly a revival. Ashbury University. Ashbury University is a Christian university. Thousands of students worshipping around the clock. That's the that's the, 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 uh, the claim. It started rather uneventfully in a regular chapel service. One of the students got up to share and confess his sins. And what followed was a time of repentance and worship that has stretched out for nearly a month. Nearly a month. And it's spreading to other parts of the country. Now, I don't know enough about what's happening. This is someone recording, you know, giving their version of it. Um, and it's too early to call it a revival. And some people have been cynical about it. But judging from some of the responses, it does look like God is on the move. So I'm just going to ask Neil, can you play that video clip now for me, please? Now, this has been reported on Fox News in America. And if you could try and make that full screen... Do we get any sound? But you can see there. Just gives you an idea of the services that they're having there. Now, so basically, what, what I love about this, particularly this this video clip, is there's no bright screen. There's, There's no, no trendy, trendy super duper super slick worship, worship service going on there. They've got a guitar, they've got a, guitar, guitar, they've got a, a piano, piano, and they've and got, got people at the front just sharing their hearts. 
At 10, 10 o'clock, about, about a month ago, ago somebody, somebody got, got up and confessed their sins. sins. From, that From that point, point until, until now, now round, round the clock, 24-7, they've been they've having been a service there. there. If you could pass that now. That has now spread. There are, there are other universities, universities in, in America, America that, that this is starting, starting to, happen. to happen. One, One university, university has reported there are, there are big queues outside, outside the university, university waiting, waiting to get into the church service. service. So, it so it does, does look, look like, like something's happening. happening. I mean, I, I hope, hope and pray it's revival. revival. I am desperate, desperate for it to be revival. revival. Because, because what, what I hope and pray is what started over there will come over here. Obviously, Obviously, just me. Just me that wants that. And, 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 and what started what over there will not, not only come over here, here in the in UK, UK, but will we'll come, come here in our in church, church and will we'll come, come here, here in our, in our hearts. hearts. That's, That's the important thing. thing. These, These people, people have just, just done something really, really, really simple. simple. They started talking to God. Really, really simple. You know, a lot of the time we look at like, What's the, What's church, the church need to do? Need do we need to do, do something, something special? special? Do we need do we to do need something to do extra special? Do we need to, you know, there's loads of stuff you can read about, you know, do this and your church will go well and do this and do this and do this. What they're doing is just praying, which is what we're doing, isn't it? Another point you could have said amen there, help me out. Come on, church, come on. That's what we're doing at the moment. We're praying for our friends, our relatives, our associates, our neighbours and our kids. God answers and hears prayer. Amen. Amen. Your, prayers, Your prayers, they are not wasted. God in his time will move. My prayer is that he moves soon. That's my prayer. I want to see something of that over here. Honestly, church, that is my heart's desire. I will give everything up to see that. To see a move like that where people are queuing to get into church. Oh, that would be... A taste, a taste of heaven for me. Heaven. And so, so my, my prayer, prayer as we, we pray, pray for our church and for our friends and for our relatives and neighbors and kids, kids is that God will also send revival. revival. Because, because it looks like he's sending it in America. America. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And we, we need, need it. it. Uh, the and UK, UK, I would say, say, is in greater need, need than the States, States. <laughs> for, for, for revival, revival to break out. Okay. So I'm going to, are we doing another song or am I passing over to you? Okay. Continue that theme. <clears throat> we have a prayer meeting tonight on Zoom for Frank. Uh, not just for the individual called Frank, but our Frank contacts. Six till seven uh, on Zoom this evening. If you can join us for a prayer meeting, it'd be great just to, uh, to, to bring the people, the individuals that we've been praying about in this season of prayer uh, to God. So he's another opportunity to do that this evening. Um, now, in a couple of weeks, uh, Rita's got a special birthday. <laughs> and we're having a, a celebratory buffet after church so we really like to know the, the numbers who are going to attend it so we can organise the catering that's uh, on Sunday the 5th of March um, here after service uh, at church so if you can come if you'd like to come please let Emma know and she can uh, keep details of her, the people who are coming for catering purposes okay um, this week uh, we've got no parents and tots as it's half term uh, the life groups will continue as normal, but I think that's it for the normal weekly notice. And I'm looking around. Who's speaking? Sorry, I can't. my wife. <laughs> that is just. So they say Sunday lunch will be held in silence. <laughs> New Horizons, yes, of course, Tuesday. New Horizons, how could I forget? I'm in so much trouble. Um, last week, uh, Nick's taking us through the book of James, and, and I hope, like me, you're finding it really uh, encouraging. Uh, I think James is a great book to get to get to grips with. We, we're also going through to the live groups. It's really enjoying, enjoying uh, sharing 
our thoughts on James. And one of the things he was talking about last week um, was <clears throat> being prejudiced towards certain people and what would happen if different individuals came into church, whether we would show them a different reaction if a premiership footballer or a rich person came in as opposed to uh, somebody else, whether we'd show any kind of prejudicial attitude. And, and why that resonated with me a little bit, because in the previous week I'd read a story in a book I'm reading, which I'm going to share with you, I thought, this morning, because it's, uh, it's important, which, which was a huge example of that and what a difference it can make when people come into church and the body of Christ don't show that, that prejudice. Okay. Now, read the book at the moment called Fearfully and Wonderfully, and it's by a guy called Dr. Paul Brand. Now, Paul Brand, um, he grew up as a child of missionary parents in India and became a world-famous surgeon. And he devoted his time as a surgeon to understanding and working with people who got leprosy. Now, you, you associate leprosy with sort of biblical times, don't you, really? You don't associate it with 21st century. It's still very prevalent. And so most of his time he spent in India working with leprosy um, patients and uh, getting to understand the disease and introduce some new procedures to, to tackle it and deal with it. Uh, and he was a very, very um, sort of strong and active Christian faith. Uh, so this book, The Marvel of Being Bearing in God's Image, he talks about how the body works but at the same time, he draws parallels as to how the body of Christ should work in the same way. It's a really interesting book. Anyway, this is what he has to say about a particular incident, uh, which uh, I think illustrates this point that we were talking about last week about the way we deal with people who come into church. I have seen what can happen when the body truly welcomes a new member. These scenes give me a lasting vision of God at work in the world, and I will mention one example. John Carmigan came to me in Valori, India, as a leprosy patient in an advanced state of the disease. We could do little for him surgically, since his feet and hands had already been damaged irreparably. We could, however, offer him a job and a place to stay. Because of one-sided facial paralysis, John could not smile normally. When he tried, the uneven distortion of his features would draw attention to his paralysis. People often responded with a gasp or a gesture of fear, and so he learned not to smile. Margaret, my wife, his wife is also a, a world-famous surgeon, stitched his eyelids partly closed to protect his sight. Though grateful for her efforts, John grew more and more paranoid about what others thought of him. Perhaps in reaction to his marred appearance, John acted out the part as a troublemaker. I remember many tense scenes in which we had to confront him with some evidence of stealing or dishonesty. He treated fellow patients cruelly and resisted authority, sometimes organizing hunger strikes against the leprosy hospital. By almost everyone's reckoning, he was beyond rehabilitation. Perhaps John's very irredeemableness attracted my aging mother to him, for she often latched onto the least attractive specimens of humanity. She spent with time with John and eventually led him into the Christian faith. He was baptized in a cement tank on the grounds of a leprosarium. Conversion, however, did not temper John's high dudgeon against the world. He gained some friends amongst fellow patients, but a lifetime of rejection and mistreatment had permanently embittered him against all non-patients. One day, almost defiantly, he asked me what would happen if he visited the local Tamil-speaking church in Valori. I went to the leaders of the church, described John, and assured them that despite obvious deformities, he had entered a safe phase of the arrested disease and would not endanger the congregation. They agreed he could visit. Can he take communion, I asked, knowing that the church used a common cup they looked at each other, thought for a moment, and agreed that he could also take communion. Shortly afterwards, therefore, I took John to the church, where, which met in a plain whitewashed brick building with a corrugated iron roof. I could hardly imagine the trauma and paranoia inside a leprosy patient who attempts for the first time to enter that kind of setting. And I stood with him at the back of the church. His paralyzed face showed no reaction, but his body's slight trembling betrayed his inner turmoil. 
I prayed silently that no church member would slow the slightest hint of rejection. As we entered during the singing of the first hymn, an Indian man toward the back of the church turned and saw us. We must have made an odd couple. A white person standing next to a leprosy patient with patches of his skin in garish disarray. I held my breath. And then it happened. The man put down his hymnal, smiled broadly and patted the chair next to him, inviting John to join him. John could not have been more startled. Haltingly, he made shuffling half steps to the row and took his seat. I breathed the prayer of thanks. That one incident proved to be the turning point of John's life. Years later, I visited Valoria and made a trip to the factory that had been set up to employ disabled people. The manager wanted to show me a machine that produced tiny screws for typewriter parts. As we walked through the noisy plant, he shouted at me that he would introduce me to his prize employee, a man who had just won the parent corporation's All India Prize for the highest quality work with the fewest rejects. As we arrived at his workstation, the employee turned to greet us, and I saw the unmistakable crooked face of John Kernigan. He wiped the grease off his stumpy hand and grinned with the ugliest, loveliest, and most radiant smile I could ever see. He held out my inspection a part of the small precision screws that he won in first prize. A simple gesture of acceptance may not seem like much, but for John Kernigan, it proved decisive. After a lifetime of being judged on his damaged appearance, he had finally been welcomed on a different basis. God's spirit had prompted the body on earth to adopt a new member, and at last John knew he belonged. Now that's a story that really touched me, and, and again, I say I was thinking about that in, in when Nick was talking last week about how we treat new people, or we hypothetically treat new people if they come into church, people who would have uh, status and celebrity and money as opposed to people like that who had nothing to offer and yet the church accepted him and uh, changed his life around and I was also reminded in reading that of the parallel that Jesus wrote about the great banquet when one of those at the table with heard him heard this he said to Jesus blessed is the one who will eat at the feast of the kingdom of God Jesus replied a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests at the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I've just bought a field. I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I've just got married, so I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servants, Go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what, is it, what you have ordered has already been done, but there's still room. Then the master told his servant, go out into the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who are invited will get a taste of my banquet. So, out into the country roads to compel those who we might see has less desirable. As it says there, the poor, the lame, the blind, the beggars. Um, and yet this is what the church did there for that individual in India. And let's hope that we do the same for the people that come with our midst. We might get people like that, who knows? But as Nick was saying last week, let's not have a prejudice in our hearts as to who we welcome into our service, into our midst. And let's act as the body of Christ in welcoming all those who Jesus brings to us and wants us to be part of our group here in Duckingfield. Okay, let's sing again, shall we? We're going to sing two songs together, is that right? Just the one. The next one chosen by Heather is Light Has Dawn That Ever Shall Blaze, which some may know, um, um, I didn't know it, but it's really quite simple to pick up. Not on. Yeah, organ's not on. Okay. 
<laughs> I think I'll have to start handcuffing Jacob to the front door at weekends and saying he can't go anywhere ever again. <laughs> oh. Okay. So I just want to, before we uh, we get John up, I just want to uh, pray for obviously people with specific needs. Uh, we're going to ask God that uh, God will move upon them. Obviously, pray for, for I'm going to pray for our Franks as well, just generally, because I want us to keep in the atmosphere of prayer and trust that God will do what we know he can do. Um, and if you have your own needs, then by all means, come before God, who's in this place right now amongst his people, give him what's on your heart, and he will do what he, only he can do. Okay, so if you could stand with this morning, and we'll pray. Father God, as we come before you, we know that you're in this place, Lord, and my desire, our desire, our heart's desire for you to be here in power, Lord. And so as we pray for needs that we've prayed for before, we don't flag in our zeal to come before you, Lord. We don't flag in our expectation that you will do what only you can do, Father. We long to see people transformed by the power of your word. Lives change. People that typically wouldn't go to church, sat in church, hearing your word, longing to know more about you. We pray all of these things. Bless our time together this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Why you stood up, go around very quickly, say hello to a few people, and then we will get John up to bring the word to us.
Okay, everybody, if you could find your way back to your seats. No, you're not. <laughs> Otherwise, you'll be named and shamed, Trevor. Recorded forever on the internet. If you can find seats, please. <laughs> okay. Um, just before we make a start and I introduce John, um, uh, we probably need to pray for the Carter household. I do feel that there's uh, something, maybe God's peace upon them. I don't know. You know what I mean? Sunday lunch is, is looming. <laughs> I am only joking. Right, I'd like to give you a big hand as John makes his way, please. Give him a big round of applause. So those of you that don't know, uh, John is an in-law. Uh, and he's still an in-law. He's not an outlaw yet. We're still friends, which is good. Um, his daughter married my son. Okay, so it's kind of like keep it in the family. Uh, and John's been here to minister before, uh, he very kindly offered to follow on, so he's going to be looking at James like we've been looking at, he's got his uh, notes ready, uh, he's got a PowerPoint for us, so I'm just going to pray and turn it over to him, so let's pray. Father, we do thank you for John and his ministry, uh, we thank you that he's a man of God, Lord, and we thank you for what you've placed in his heart, I do pray that you're word would come forth, it would find fertile ground in our hearts as we receive and understand and learn more about you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Great. Thank you. Well, listen, it's great to be here with you once again. It's, it's always a pleasure to open God's Word, isn't it? And uh, when Nick just says you could do something that you, if you'd like on your own back, or you can follow on from James, I looked at this text of James, and I thought, this is a, this is a, a great book to be standing anyway. It's, it's one of my favorite ones, and what a great passage to carry on with. So I elected, if, if hopefully Nick doesn't mind, just to carry on. So this morning, we're going to carry on looking at James chapter 2, and uh, Nick last week expounded James chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, uh, highlighting the issue that had crept into the early church of showing partiality of showing favoritism that people were being favored or certain people were being favored over others and it's an issue uh, that was specifically stated by James that the rich were being favored were being shown as favorites over and above the poor and Nick highlighted and Peter again has alluded to it already this morning is the era of partiality the area era of favoritism and it should be reiterated pretty much in every church, and it should be in every church even today, not just in James's time. For God's invitation to fellowship, to discipleship, to worship, to scripture reading, to prayer, that invitation is open to everyone, regardless of wealth, status, background, isn't it? But still, it can be an issue that we face today. Favoritism, partiality is certainly, hopefully it's not happening in the church, but if it does, it needs to be faced. But certainly we come up against it out in the world, don't we? Maybe you've experienced it in the world, in the workplace, in and amongst family where you've been perhaps excluded or overlooked or somebody has favored somebody else above you for whatever reason. James, even in the world setting, encourages us to, encourages us to challenge this kind of thinking. And so, well, James 2, chapters 1 through 7, address perhaps what we could look at as the era of partiality. James 8 through 13 looks at the seriousness and the way that God views the seriousness of showing partiality and favoritism. And so we're going to look at that over these next few verses, and hopefully we'll have some PowerPoints coming up behind me. Is that all right? Are you seeing a bit of, there we go, Okay. So as we jump into the section, we've really got, we're going to be looking at two laws that actually James introduces here. One, he talks about the royal law, where we're going to look at that in verses 8 through 11. And then verses 12 and 13, we're going to look at what he calls the law of liberty. 
And just by way of clarity, I'm going to be using the ESV version. I know that you've got the NIV version of the Bible in front of you, but I've, I'm going to be using the ESV because it actually it, it uses that term expressly, the law of liberty. In the NIV, it says the law that bring, gives freedom. Regardless of the phrase, they both mean oh, just, just two different ways of expressing the same thing, really. So let's read James 2, verses 8 through 13 together. If you really fulfill the loyal, royal law, according to the scripture, you, will, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not murder, commit adultery, but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak, so act, as those who are judged under the law of liberty, or the law that gives freedom. <clears throat> For judgment is without mercy to one who, who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Verse 8, going back to the beginning. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. If you do this, James says, you are doing well. And we all want to do well, don't we? James here introduces the royal law. What is that? The royal law is simply a quote. It's uh, from scripture. that is basically a, a summary statement. It sums up how we are to treat, how we are to interact, how we are to respond to others. The summary statement is, love your neighbor as yourself. You might have heard of a, of a similar idea expressed in the golden rule. Do we know what the golden rule is? Do unto others as you would have, us, have them do unto you. That's from Mark, Matthew 7 and Luke 6. Actually, the, that phrase, but the rule, golden rule, is not is not there. It's not part of scripture. As I look at this, I, I always tend to think of that being the silver rule. Why? What's the golden rule? It's the one that comes before. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. That should be the golden rule. And then love your neighbor as yourself. The golden rule inspires the silver rule, which is do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But whether we look at the golden rule or the royal law, both of these things express the same idea. We are to love others as ourselves. We are to do unto others as we would like them to do unto us. So where do we find this royal law in Scripture? Where did James come and get this royal law from? Well, he looked back into the Old Testament. He looked back into Leviticus chapter 19, and he was looking at about 10 verses from, uh, from 9 through 18. And at the back of those 10 verses, at the very end, verse, 9, uh, verse 18, it says, love your neighbor as yourselves. And so I just wanted to take a quick look at that chapter in Leviticus, because I feel like it's worth us having a bit of a look at, and you'll have to forgive me because I've squeezed it in. I wanted to put all the text in there so you could see a few things. All right, so let's just read this passage together. Are we able to move it on? Yeah? Is it? Oh, there we go. You probably can't see that. It's probably a bit too tight, but it just says these words. I'm just going to read it there. When you reap the harvest of your, of your land, you shall reap your field right, you shall not reap your field right to the edge, neither shall you gather the, the gleanings of the harvest. And you shall not strip your vineyard bare, neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them to the poor and the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. You shall not steal, you shall not deal falsely. You shall not lie to one another. You shall not swear by my name falsely, and so profane the name of the Lord your God. I am the Lord. You shall not oppress your neighbor or rob him. The wages of a hired servant shall not remain you all night until the morning. You shall not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block before the blind, but you shall fear your God. I am the Lord. You shall do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but in righteousness you shall judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not stand up against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your brother or 
can't read that little bit. But you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you, hear, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against your sons or your own people, for you, for you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. I wanted to so hopefully just to paint that a little bit of a picture up there, because uh, as you read through that passage, you come across this phrase, you shall or you shall not, or neither shall you. You come across that combination 21 different times. God wants relationships to work smoothly. God wants his relations, our, our relationships amongst one another to work with care, to work with compassion, to work with great consideration for one another. And so he highlights 21 times how those relationships should be and ought to be managed. And he sums that up with that one great law, love your neighbor as yourself. Did you notice there five times it mentions, I am the Lord. As I was just reading through that myself, just this thought came back to me. In these, as we read through those verses, those five phrases, I am the Lord, reminds me of that, that scripture in the New Testament where it says, when you do this to the least of my brethren, you do it, what? As unto me. I think God throws his whole identity into this, that when we are watching over one another and caring for one another and not showing partiality or favoritism to one another, we're actually doing it in a similar sense unto him when we do someone for somebody else we're looking out for God's best interest one further point of interest in in Leviticus 19 is that Moses doesn't just stop there he uses that phrase love your neighbor as yourself one other time and it's found in verse 34 and actually rather than talking about a neighbor here he's talking about a sojourner an alien verse 33 and 34 read like this when a soldier, when a stranger sojourns with you in the land you shall not do him any wrong you shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as a native among you and you shall love him as yourself for you were strangers in the land of egypt i am the lord your god here god and uh, 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 moses is not just talking about the neighbor, but he's also talking about the sojourner, the foreigner, the stranger. The implication being is that we should be looking after and watching over all people, not treating anybody with partiality or favoritism. So just coming back to our text then, that is where we got this royal law from. That's where James got it from, and that's where he and we can learn about what the entirety of that law really means. But just to sum up what James is saying in verse 8, what does he say about the person who does fulfill that royal law? At the very end there, it says, you are doing well. James commend those who don't show partiality or favoritism. James commends those who treat everyone with dignity, with, with respect. James commends everyone who will honor whoever comes into the doors sits in the pews, whether they're poor, rich, a famous footballer or not a famous footballer, it doesn't matter. He says, listen, when we fulfill that royal law, we are doing well. Verse 9 then steps into where we see the seriousness of what happens when we break the royal law. Verse 8, the royal law is identified. Verses 9, 10, 11, the royal law is being ignored. And how does God take that? How does James see it? What does God want to teach us about this royal law? We're going to look at that over the next few verses. And in these verses, James doesn't hold back. Because James says in verse 9, But if you show partiality, you are committing a sin. And you are convicted by the law as a transgressor. James does two things in this verse. First, he labels the action of showing partiality and prejudice. He labels it very, very clearly. Guys, it's sin. And then he designates those who might participate in this action of showing partiality, showing favoritism. And he says, you're a transgressor. In the NIV, it's a, you're a lawbreaker. John MacArthur had an interesting take on this verse as I was studying, and he comments on these two ver those two words, sin and transgressor. 
sin pertains to missing that mark. It's like a, 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 the illustration is archery. You shoot an arrow, it completely misses the mark. And that's what sin is. Transgressor is someone who willfully goes beyond the pre prescribed limit. They, they don't just miss the mark, they overstep the mark. In the one case, a person comes up too short. In the other, he goes too far. Both are sinful. The take-home message is this. The one who shows partiality, the one who shows favoritism, steps beyond God's acceptable limit. They've crossed a boundary too far. They have become a lawbreaker. As we come to verse 10, though, James wraps up this thought even a bit further. He wants us to see the seriousness again of this. Verse 10 starts off with that word for. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. That word for in the Greek is, is the word gar, G-A-R. And it's actually, it's, a, it's an important word to perhaps take note of as we're reading scripture because James uses it, Paul uses it a lot. It's a bit like that word therefore. When you read the word therefore, you've got to go back to see what it's there for, don't you? And in the very same way, that word for can have some, uh, a very specific meaning. So as we read through the word for in, in the passages here, you'll see it highlighted in red a few times. We need to be thinking that um, it, it's there because it gives a reason for what has just been said, or it seeks to explain what has just been said. So verse 10 seeks to explain verse 11. Sorry, verse 10, uh, verse 10 seeks to explain verse 9. And in James' case, he uses this word for to intensify the argument for the, the, the seriousness that God takes this sin of showing partiality. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails at one point has become accountable for all of it. In other words, James is saying that if we fulfill the royal law, if we show partiality and favoritism, we are, uh, yet we are completely innocent of all the other laws, we are still held accountable as a lawbreaker. We are still held accountable as a, a transgressor of the law. You see, James here is really getting to the nature and the heart of you and I a little bit. Because in your heart, and my heart perhaps, or I'm certainly speaking for me, we like to play down sin, don't we? We can play down sin in our own lives. We can see sins as some being major, some being minor. I do that. I don't know if you do. But God says, no, you fail in one part of the law, you break the whole law. You fail in one part, you've broken it all. Again, do we get that sense of the seriousness with which James is addressing this to his listeners and his readers in the early church? To explain this, James and Paul and God presents the law as a unity. Yes, you've got your different laws, but there's a, there's a unity within the law. God sees the law like a pane of glass. If a rock hits a large pane of glass and a small part of that glass gets shattered or cracked, essentially, that whole glass is ruined. You can't just replace that small little portion of glass. Yes, you could mend it, you can cover it over, but in order to really fix that fault, that whole glass needs to be placed. To get it back to its original state, the whole pane of, of that window must be replaced. When we break God's royal law, we sin, we are transgressors. It's as if we had broken the whole pain. It's as if, and it's as if we will be held accountable as lawbreakers. This is a quote that I got from one of the uh, commentators that I was just reading through from a Precept Austin website. And it just says this, the significance of these words are this that we cannot pick and choose the laws that we keep and the laws that we violate, which I'm prone to do. Again, I see the laws that, okay, these are just little things and I can get away with it. But these are big things and I can't get away. No, the, this passage designates against that. We cannot pick and choose the laws we keep and the laws we violate. We cannot build up a merit system with God by keeping most of the laws and only being allowed to break a few laws. No, God says you do one. We're a lawbreaker. 
We cannot become more acceptable to God because we keep most of the laws and break only a few. And lastly, we cannot claim to be claim greater righteousness than other people because we keep more laws than they do and break fewer. No, the challenge is, even if we commit one sin, one transgression, we broke, we're guilty of breaking all of the law. As if that's not enough, though, James goes on into verse 11. For, again, here's another uh, expansion of what James has been saying. For, he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. There again, James is using that word for to explain, to intensify already what he's been talking about. James does not use this verse to compare showing partiality or favoritism with murder and adultery. He's not doing that. He's not attempting to discuss lesser or greater sins. He's not attempting to discuss heavier or lighter sins. James's argument centers on the individual commands that God has given all of the commands. And as believers, we are called to be consistent and consistently obedient to every command, not just some and not just to pick and choose. It's an extreme comparison. But by that extreme comparison of partiality to murder, of adultery to favoritism, God simply highlights the fact, or James simply highlights the fact that God hates, he cannot abide all sin. And to let us know that when we sin, no matter at what level, we become transgressors and lawbreakers. By implication then, partiality, favoritism is a sin. It's a sin and an offense against God. I am the Lord, if we remember back to Leviticus 19. And like any sin, God takes it seriously, as seriously as he does adultery or murder. Are we getting the picture here? Last week, Nick gave us the error of partiality and showing favoritism and really expressed that it shouldn't be part of it. But in these verses here, we get a sense of how serious God takes this issue as well. And we need to sit up, pay attention. We are the body of Christ. And therefore, we cannot allow partiality or favoritism to come through our doors. So, is there a mechanism? Is there some way that will help us on fulfilling, on keeping, on upholding this royal law, and not allowing us to slip into perhaps that pattern of thinking where we do show favoritism? Because the reality is that we can be tempted to sin in this way, can't we? We all wrestle with our fallen nature. We all look at people and perhaps make judgments. We all um, have our own emotions and feelings and impressions about others, don't we? But at the same time, we all want to honor God. At the same time, we want to love our neighbor as ourselves. We want to do our best for our neighbor. So is there a way that, or is there a mechanism that, that helps us with that? And I think James brings that out as we jump now into verses 12 and 13. Because here James reminds us, and he reminds the early church of the law of liberty. Or in your translation, in the NIV, it's the law that gives freedom. Verses 12 and 13 read like this. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy, but mercy triumphs over judgment. Verse 12 is actually quite a powerful verse. Why? Because it reminds us that we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of God one day. Don't forget, James is writing to Christians here. He's not writing to non-Christians. He's, he's writing to Christians. And he's reminding them, you are going to stand before the judgment seat of God one day. As you stand before that judgment seat, you are not going to be judged as a criminal because you've rejected and rebelled against God all your life and your, your departure will be into hell. But what he does say is you're going to stand before the judgment seat as my son, as my daughter, and you will be judged by your works. And therefore, he says, speak and act wisely. Speak and act 
as though knowing that one day you're going to have to give account before God for the things that you say and you do. You're going to have to give an account before God for your words and for your actions and how you treated your brothers and sisters. Just a few other scriptures that highlight that. One of them is Romans 14, verses 10 through 12. Why do you pass judgment on your brothers? Or why do you despise your brothers? For, here's the explanation again, for we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, listen to this again, each one of us will give an account of himself to God. It's a great challenge for us, isn't it? It's one of those markers, if we keep that in the back of my mind, in the back of our minds, the less we are prone to sin, the less we will be prone to transgress. Another one is 2 Corinthians 5, 9 through 10. So whether we're at home or away, we make it our aim to please him in church, away from church, not showing favoritism, not showing partiality. Why? Because it pleases him. For, here's the explanation of it, for we must appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in his body, whether good or evil. When you and I, as Christians, as believers, stand before the judgment seat of God, is to receive a reward. It's not to be condemned to hell for eternity, but it's to step into eternity and be rewarded for those things that we've done or not done. Again, another text that you might want to look at is 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 15, where it talks about uh, the good things that we do. We're, we're building for our eternal kingdom with with gold, silver, and bronze, those are the things that we'll take into eternity. At the same time, we can build with wood, hay, and stubble. And on that day, when we stand and present those to God, guess what? Those things are going to go. Those are going to be burned up as in the fire. We're still going to be in heaven, but the bad things, the worthless things that we've done will just get burned up. So the encouragement is what? Build with bronze, silver, and gold, those things that will take and, and last in eternity. Folks, just that first thought from verse 12 is, you and I are going to stand before God. As believers, we won't be condemned to hell. We will go into heaven. But what we will do is we'll be judged as his sons and his daughters. What have you done with what I have given to you? That will be our judgment. And so James's encouragement is this, speak and act in a way that you know you're going to have to stand on that before that judge on that day and give an account of what we have done. But there's a second perspective to this, and this is where the law of liberty comes in. What is the law of liberty? The law of liberty is essentially, it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the good news that a man, no matter how shattered, how broken, how cracked, how darkened his glass may be because of his many transgressions through repentance, through faith in Jesus, and relying upon Jesus, that man can be completely transformed. That man can know his sins forgiven. That man can know his transgressions covered over. And because that man has experienced God's grace and God's love, because that man has known for himself God's grace and God's love, because he has experienced the law of liberty, he can then extend that grace and that love, and that mercy to others, regardless of their status, regardless of their color, regardless of their appearance. Because of God's favor upon us, rebellious sinners and even enemies of God at one time, we extend that same grace and favor shown to us, to others, without favoritism, without partiality. I love that scripture that says, just as we have received, so we give. Just as we received that grace and that mercy abundantly because we were that, those shattered, broken, darkened bits of glass. But when we gave our lives to Christ, when we confessed our sins, Christ transformed us. He gave us new life. And that's what we want to pass on. We don't want to pass on our own judgments. We don't want to pass on our own condemnations. We don't want to pass on... We want to pass on what has been given to us, grace and love, and we treat all accordingly. So when we think of this law, 
sorry, when we think of these two things, though, sometimes we can think of them as opposites, can't we? We think of law and we think of liberty as being two different things. Sometimes people think, well, if I'm going to be obedient to the law, then it's going to restrict my liberty. It's a bit like, a, it's, a, it's an oxymoron, that, that phrase, isn't it? Oxymoron, like simple meth or giant shrimp. I quite like those ones. But the way that I love to look at this, as is, is was shown to me, is that this law of the liberty is like the fish in a sea. Fish in the sea are completely at liberty. In the sea, they live and they thrive. Take them out of the sea. Take them out of the laws that govern the seas and the oceans and all the um, components of the ocean. Take them out of that and put them on land. They perish. You see, they were created to live and function within the sea and all the laws of the sea that are entailed there. They have full liberty as they swim. And the analogy comes over to us. God has created us for himself. And when we obey his guidelines, when we live within his boundaries, we thrive, we flourish. When we get outside of those boundaries, when we get outside of those laws and those guidelines, and we can do so because God's given us free choice and free will. But when we do that, we too perish. There is complete liberty for the person who lives and acts within God's law because that is why God created for us. God, that is why God created us to live within his laws and his guidelines. There is complete liberty when we do that. We get into trouble when we step beyond those boundaries. But just as I close, I just want to finish off with one last passage, actually from James, and it's one that you guys will have covered a few weeks back. I think it was Nick that brought some ministry on it. But it's James chapter 1, verses 23 through 25. This morning, we've been looking at the royal law, and because we love God, we must also love our neighbor as ourselves. We must love impartially, and we must love without bias. To do otherwise is to sin and transgress. But we've also looked at the law of liberty, that because God has offered us his grace, because God has offered us his mercy, because God has offered us his favor, we too, because of that liberty that has been shown to us, we too can show that to others, to our brother, to our sister, to the neighbor, to a stranger. But James highlights this phrase, the law of liberty, one other time. And it's found in verses 22 to 25. Let's just read that together. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving ourselves. For, explanation again. For, if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at, the natural at his natural face in a mirror. For, explanation, he looks at himself and he goes away and at once forgets what he is like. But, good to recognize that but there. But, the one who looks intently into the perfect law, the law of liberty, that law that we've just been talking about, and perseveres, carries on, even though it can be difficult, even though it will be challenging at times, but perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, and a doer who will be rewarded when we stand before God at the judgment seat, a doer who will receive recompense as his son and as his slave for doing what he's asked us to do, will be rewarded for that. But it finishes off here. He will be blessed in all his doing. The one who fulfills the royal law, James said in chapter 2, verse 8, does well. The one who does the royal law does well. But the one who fulfills the law of liberty, James says, will be blessed in all he does. Do you want the blessing of God on your life? Do you want the blessing of God in, in your family and in your workplace and in your neighborhood and in your schools? One of the ways we do that is we fulfill this law of liberty. We live as Christ did and what has been given to us in grace and mercy we show to others. Heavenly Father, we just want to say thank you for these words from James. Lord, we are challenged every day by feelings and emotions to react differently to certain ones. 
But Father, your scriptures today remind us that we are your children because we've been forgiven much, because we have received much grace and much mercy. Then God, as we live out our daily lives in our schools and our workplaces and wherever we might be, the sports fields, whatever, God, that we go out to be like Christ. We go bear out and we can show that grace. We can show that love. We can show that favor to others. Lord, guard us from that sin that we can easily fall into of showing partiality, of showing favoritism. Lord, let that be far from our minds. Father, we don't want to be transgressed. But Lord, help us when we do transgress to recognize we've got a loving God, a loving Father we can come to, ask forgiveness and repent. But Lord, more than anything, may we have in our hearts that we want to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant, because we've done our best to fulfill the royal law. We've done our best to live according to the law of liberty. Lord, help us, we pray. We need your spirit working and moving in us as we do this in our daily life. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Thank you. If you'd like to stand for the last song, thanks.
thanks for your word this morning, John. I've really been challenged. So um, I really feel like I've been spoken to this morning. So thank you for your word. I hope other people in the congregation feel the same. And please acknowledge, John, after the service, if the message is brought this morning as you feel it has been for you. I'll just close in prayer. Dear Lord God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you we've been able to freely join together. We thank you for the word John's brought us. We thank you for the encouragement Nick brought us about what's happening in the churches in America. We just pray as we continue to pay for our francs and the meeting we have later today that we'll all be really blessed. We thank you already for the prayers that are being answered. You're an amazing God and we just want to praise and worship you this morning. Amen. Please help yourself to refreshments. Don't forget the Frank prayer meeting is on Zoom tonight, six till seven o'clock. Thank you.